We've been studying the, the power of surprising grace as we've been looking at the book of Acts. And we've seen the amazing grace of God causing the spread of the gospel in the first century church. We've seen miraculous grace. We've seen signs and wonders. We've seen lives changed. We've seen people healed. We've seen people raised from the dead. But in the book of Acts, we also see suffering. We also see persecution. How come some Christians experience the miraculous and other Christians experience martyrdom? As the saying goes, it's a mystery to me. Turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. We're going to dive deeply into this whole concept of mystery. Has it ever struck you that on the Sunday mornings when we're here gathered together, sitting in peace, that around the world there are other brothers and sisters that are sitting in the midst of persecution? Why is that? Why them? Why not us? It's a mystery. A film that's been out for a while, I've shown several clips from it before, but I don't think I've shown this one, that really causes us to grapple with this whole topic of mystery is Dead Poet Society. It stars uh, Robin Williams as Mr. Keating. Mr. Keating uh, is an alumnus of a very proud, traditional, rigid, legalistic college prep school for boys. In this school, it is not the norm for people to grapple with mystery. Everything is supposedly nice and clear-cut and obvious and known and understood. There are rules and policies for everything, and there's no room for mystery. Well, Mr. Keating somehow has gotten in touch with the passions of his heart and the mysteries of life. And he wants to impart that same vitality and mystery to the students. In the clip I'm about to show, Keating is teaching the first day of class uh, to a bunch of literature students, and they're studying the topic of poetry. They open a textbook where the author has reduced the art of poetry into graphing equations and pulling all of the mystery out of it. I want you to notice how bored the students are at first and then what happens to them, how they come alive when Keating begins to talk to them about mystery. J. Evans Pritchard, Ph.D., took poetry, art for the heart, and made it into arithmetic for the head. He reduced mystery to graphing equations. And how do you do that with God? How have you done that with the Christian life? How have you reduced mystery into formulas? and recipes in an attempt to avoid mystery. I mean, consider the eternality of God. God never wasn't. He's always been there. He always will be there. He's uncreated. And out of nothing, he created all things. Your, your head can't grasp that. Your heart can simply choose to relish the mystery. The Trinity, 
Three persons, one God, not three gods. Three persons of the Godhead. Your mind cannot understand that fully. But your heart can choose to relish the mystery. And one of the reasons why so few Christians today are relishing their walk with God and are enjoying the Christian life is because just like J. Evans Pritchard, we've taken something that's supposed to fill our hearts with mystery and we've reduced it to formulas. Well, Dead's Poet Society is not the only place we're challenged to walk deeply into the waters of mystery. The scriptures call us to mystery as well. And the passage before us this morning, Acts 12, 1 to 17, is going to bring us face to face with mystery. Let's all stand out of reverence for the Word of God. Follow along as I read Acts 12, verses 1 to 17. This is God's Word. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up, quickly! And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened it, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. Dear flock of God, this is God's word. And he gave it to us so that we might swim in the oceans of mystery. Let's pray. Father, we're not comfortable with mystery. We want to understand how things work. We want to understand everything we can. And so, Lord, we tend to demystify the Christian life. We tend to make it into rules and formulas and recipes. And, Father, we miss your glory. So, Holy Spirit, come and restore mystery to our lives, the ability, the capacity to embrace it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So there are three elements of mystery that we are called to embrace in this passage. First of all, surrender to the mystery of providence. Look at verse 1. 
Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now, what if you were one of the some? What questions would you be asking yourself? Perhaps I'd be asking, well, God, why me? Why not them? God, what did I do? If I'd have done that instead of this, would I be here? Or maybe you're not one of the some. Maybe you haven't been arrested by Herod. Do you start developing recipes and formulas? Well, God, it's because I did this and because I didn't do that. It was by my own wisdom, my own strength, my own power, my own control. Or, in both cases, whether you were one of the some or were not one of the some, do you simply surrender to the mystery of God's providence? What is providence? God's providence is His ruling and ordaining over all things in my life and your life for His own glory, for our good, for our spiritual transformation, for the defeat of evil, and for the transformation of lives around us and the culture in which we live. That's God's providence. His ruling and ordaining over all things for His glory and our good. The first time that Peter was arrested in Acts chapter 4, when he was released along with John, the church got together and they prayed and they praised God and they looked at what happened to them and looked what happened to Jesus. They had been released, Jesus had been killed. And in their prayers, they praised God as the one who was in control by his providence, that everything that happened to Jesus and everything happening to them happened according to God's hand and his predestined plan. You'll find that in Acts 4.28. God is absolutely sovereign. However, we don't often understand what God is up to in his providence. One of my favorite verses to help people with mystery, including myself, is Deuteronomy 29 29. In Deuteronomy 29 29, the Holy Spirit inspires, we think, Moses to write, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. There are secret things, secret purposes, secret plans of God's providence that we cannot understand. And all we can do obediently is to surrender. Look at verse 2. He killed, Herod killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now think about this. James was part of the inner circle. Jesus spent time with all the disciples But he had an inner circle of James and John and Peter. And he spent more time with Peter, James, and John than any of the other disciples. Those three went to places with Jesus that none of the other twelve went. They heard and saw things with Jesus that none of the other twelve saw or heard. And yet months after Christ's resurrection, one of the inner circle is killed you find yourself saying, what a waste. Jesus was God. He knew James was going to be killed with the sword very early on in the church's growth. Why did he spend all that time pouring into James? Why didn't he pour into Matthew that was going to write a gospel? I don't know. Nobody knows. But God knows. And all we can do is surrender to the mystery of providence. Look at verse 3. When Herod saw that it pleased the Jews to put James to death, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Why do you arrest Peter? Why not the other apostles? I don't know. It's the mystery 
of providence. Look at verse 7. Peter escapes by the hand of the angel. Why did Peter escape? Could the angel have led James to escape? Well, sure the angel could have. Why didn't he? I don't know. It's the mystery of providence. It's not for us to figure out why one gets rescued and one doesn't. It's not for us to figure out why this person has that experience and you have the very opposite. One of the great chapters in Scripture is Hebrews chapter 11. It's the great chapter of faith. And it talks about how the Old Testament saints were commended for their faith, for pleasing God by surrendering to God in utter trust. And it says that they were commended because they believed by faith that God existed forever, was uncreated, and out of nothing he made all things. And then Abraham was commended for leaving his homeland, not knowing where God's providence was going to lead him, and surrendering to providence. And Sarah was commended for her faith, trusting that though other people were able to have children, she wasn't. And then trusting God's promise that she would be able to conceive in her old age. And on and on and on. And then you get to around verse 33. And the author says, I don't have time to talk about other people. He says, some people conquered kingdoms. He's talking about Joshua and Jericho and all the battles. He goes on to say that, uh, that, that others stopped the mouths of lions. Daniel. Some quenched the power of the fire, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Others saw the dead raised to life. Elisha saw that. And then suddenly it shifts. Those by faith saw all those things happen. Others, what is understood by faith, just as much faith as those who saw miracles, others who had just as much faith were tortured. Others suffered mocking and flogging. Still others were chained and imprisoned. Some were stoned, others were sawn in two, and still others were killed with the sword. How come Daniel was spared from the lions? And thousands of first century Christians were fed to the lions. I don't know. It's the mystery of providence. How come Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were protected from the flames? And thousands of first century Christians were burned at the stake. I don't know. It's the mystery of providence. How come someone else's life that you know is going like this and you're wrestling with? I don't know. You see, we want to reduce the mystery of providence to formulas, recipes, equations, and we can't. God is God, and He's infinite. And there are things that he has predestined that we just cannot comprehend. He's infinite. We're finite. He's holy. We're fallen. How could we even begin to think that we could figure God out? So, where is God calling you this morning to surrender? to providence. 
How is God saying to you, you, you'll never understand this, this side of eternity. My plan is bigger than you could ever dream. My plan involves you, but it's bigger than you. And I have designs on your life that you cannot imagine. But will you trust me? Will you believe that my heart toward you was good? Will you trust that I know what I'm doing, even if you have no idea what I'm doing? Will you believe that I am infinitely wise and I have the nations in view and you play a bigger part than you realize. If you're going through suffering and heartache today, I am so, so sorry. And I can't tell you why. All we can do is surrender to the mystery of providence. And then secondly, we're called to engage in the mystery of prayer. Look at verse 5. Earnest prayer for Peter was being made to God by the church. And then there's this miraculous deliverance of Peter. And then look at verse 12. Many were gathered together and were praying. Luke couldn't be more clear. Luke is setting us up as the reader so that we might not miss, so that we can't miss that the reason Peter experienced this miraculous escape was because the people were earnestly praying to God. Now, wait a minute, Bob. You just said it's God's providence. You just said, and Scripture backs it up, that God works all things according to His predetermined plan. That God's providence is His sovereign, supernatural ruling and ordaining of all things that comes to pass for His glory, my good, my transformation, the bringing the gospel to the nations, the transformation of lives around me, and the transformation of culture. And now you're saying that Luke writes the account so that we would see that it was the prayers of God's people that made the difference. How can that be? I don't know. I don't know, but it is what it is. Guess what? That's mystery. And I say this as gently as I can. If you don't like that, then you're really going to struggle with God. And if you don't like mystery, you're really going to struggle with the Christian life. If everything has to be neat and clean and nicely cut and packaged and wrapped and tied with a bow in your life, you're going to struggle. There are often truths in Scripture that seem to our puny, finite, fallen minds to be contradictory, like sovereignty and prayer. If God's already in control, then why pray? I don't know. But God's Word says prayer works. And God's Word says that prayer matters. And this passage is clearly leading us to the conclusion that the prayers of the people move the hand of God to release Peter. Now, do you think people were praying for James? Of course they were. Well, then why did God release Peter and not James? I don't know. But I'll tell you this. Not one prayer on behalf of James went unheard. And I'll also tell you this. Not one prayer for James went unheard. Answered. 
As a matter of fact, I could make a pretty good case that God actually answered the prayers more dramatically for James' rescue than for Peter's rescue. Because Peter was rescued from Herod. James, in his death, was rescued from all sin, all brokenness, and any enemy he ever feared. James' death surely impacted the church every bit as Peter's release, if not more. Your every prayer is heard, and your every prayer makes a difference, and your every prayer is answered. How it's answered at times is a mystery. But God's word is clear on this. In Exodus chapter 17, uh, we see Israel battling the Midianites, their enemy. And they're down on a plain, and Moses is up on the mountain, and he looks down over the battle. And as long as he has the staff of God in his arms raised, Israel gains ground against the enemy. But as Moses tires and the staff begins to be lowered, the enemy begins to gain ground and Israel, the people of God, are in retreat. Aaron and Hur have to pick up Moses' arms and keep them up because if the staff is not up, the Midianites win. Look, that is just not a story. That is... That is an illustration of the power of prayer and intercession. Notice in verse 5, it says they were praying earnestly. That means at a stretch. That, that's a word used in, in track and in field where a sprinter, in order to get just a millisecond off their time, stretches with all their might to break the tape. That's the prayer God calls us to. That's the prayer that the early church engaged in. See, it's a mystery. How does providence and prayer work together? We can't figure it out, but we're called to engage in the mystery of prayer. C.S. Lewis, I think, did a great job talking about work and prayer. He said, look, if, if God allows you to affect life at all, then you should be able to understand how prayer works. For instance, you may be eating a steak, and you want salt on the steak. Certainly God has already predestined whether you're going to have salt on the steak, so God should be able to just put salt on the steak or make the steak taste salty, right? No, you put salt on the steak. You affect your experiences in life by salting your steak. He says, surely God would know whether you should remain dry or wet in a thunderstorm, but yet you bring an umbrella. You are actually able to affect and impact your own life and the life of others by your actions. By putting an umbrella, you keep the rain from getting you wet. C.S. Lewis says, if you affect life in any way through any activity, then you should be able to understand prayer. Prayer is like any action. Prayer is like any deed. As you pray, you're affecting life. Just like you affect the taste of steak when you put salt on it. When you utter a prayer, it changes the world. Well, if God's sovereign, why pray? I don't understand how it works. And guess what? I don't need to. And neither do you. I'm not telling us to put our brains on the shelf. I'm telling you, if you don't love to live with mystery, your head's going to explode on the shelf. See, for some of us, we need to repent of intellectual arrogance. There comes a point when God says, I am God, you are not, you will never figure me out, 
And I'm simply asking you to do what you need to do. And that is surrender to my providence and engage in prayer. And then thirdly and finally, we don't just surrender to providence, engage in prayer. We also in this passage see that we cooperate with the mystery of participation. There's an incredible interchange in this passage. I I encourage you to to reread the passage this week. There's an incredible interplay, interchange between the supernatural and the natural. There's an incredible interchange between sovereignty and responsibility, between providence and participation. Look at verse 7, okay? The angel struck Peter in the side and said, get up quickly. Why? Why? Look, if God ordained the release of Peter, then why did he need to be quick about it? It's like, angel, man, chill. God's got this, man. No, the angel said, quick. You get the impression if Peter wasn't quick, he wasn't going to get rescued. How can that be? I don't know. It's a mystery. Verse 8, dress yourself, put on your sandals, wrap your cloak around you. Listen, the angel is protecting Peter supernaturally from the guards. And then he says, I'm not going to protect your feet from the rocks. You better put on your sandals. If he could protect him from those soldiers, why couldn't he protect his feet? He could. He just wasn't going to. Why? I don't know. We need like Abbott and Costello. Who's on first? I mean, we just don't understand. But they're both true. And folks, you have got to come to grips with mystery or you will go nuts as a Christian. But God doesn't only want you sane. He wants you vigorously alive. And mystery isn't something we just need to submit to. Mystery is actually something we can learn to relish and enjoy. And it adds a dimension to the Christian life and to our walk with God that many of us fail to experience. Look at verse 10. The gate opened on its own accord. But in verse 16, when Rhoda forgot Peter, left him at the gate, Why didn't the angel open the gate again? The angel opened the gate of the prison. Why not open the gate of Mary's house? I don't know. But he had to wait there and keep knocking. We can't understand the providence of God. We can't understand our responsibility, our participation, but it's all true. Now, here's the thing. Some of us are on opposite ends of the mystery continuum. Some of us are way over here in participation. It's what I do. It's my responsibility. It's my control. i got to be quick, like Peter said. I've got to put on my clothes. I've got to get going. And then others of us are on the other side of the mystery continuum. God's in control. I can chill. It's all going to work out. Matter of fact, many of you in marriages, God has done this on purpose. He's brought together two different people on opposite ends of the continuum. Why? Because we all need balance, that's why. We all need integration. The participation people need to be around the providence people. And the providence people need to be around the participation people. And we all need to be around the prayer people. Amen. Amen. There was an old, wise Scottish Presbyterian who uh, had a rowboat on a lake. And it was his job to row um, sightseers from one end of the lake to the other because there were no roads. And there was a castle over there that people wanted to see. It was the protection. The lake was the protection when the king lived there. And uh, people who went with this old Scotsman noticed that on his oars, he had, he had, his oars were named. They were labeled. Uh, the one oar was, was labeled Providence. And the other oar was labeled participation. And out in the middle of the lake, people would probably uh, often say, look, okay, you got me. 
what is going on here? And this guy wanted to teach people the mystery of the Christian life. And he said, well, I'm going to put down this oar called participation, and I'm just going to use this oar called providence. And he just rowed with one oar. What happened? He went around in circles. He didn't get anywhere. Made no progress. Then he laid down that oar called providence, and he picked up that oar called participation. And he rowed with that one oar. What happened? He went around in circles, just a different opposite circle, right? And then he says, but this is the Christian life. He put in participation and providence and rowed them swiftly across the lake. Look, we row our boats in the ocean of mystery. And you may not like it, but God wants you to love it. He wants you to relish it. He wants you to be able to navigate and swim and enjoy those waters of mystery. And look, the greatest mystery is not even providence and prayer and participation. In Colossians 2, Paul says the greatest mystery is Christ. The mystery of God, namely Christ. Why would God send Christ to live and die for us? I don't know. It's a mystery. How how could Christ be born of a virgin and be both God and man at the same time? I don't know. It's a mystery. How could the obedience of Christ purchase God's delight for me? I don't know. But I'm happy for the mystery. Why do some people hear the gospel and don't respond? And other people hear the gospel and do. I don't know. It's a mystery. But here's the thing. You can't sit around and ask yourself, is God going to give me faith? I've just presented the gospel to you. And Jesus says, today is the day of salvation. Come and be forgiven. Come and be changed. I don't know what you're facing in your individual lives. You may be a control freak. You may be a let go, let God person. But Jesus is saying, come and embrace the mystery. It's both and. Get godly counsel. Live in community. Learn to live an integrated Christian life. The Christian life is filled with mystery. And praise God, we end our time today with one of the greatest mysteries of all. The sacrament of Holy Communion. Sacrament means mystery. Now, what's the mystery of communion? The mystery of communion is that Christ is mysteriously present in this table, at this table. And as you partake of these elements, somehow, we can't understand how, Christ is actually communicating the benefits of his finished work to your life, to my life, in an increased fashion. The night in which Christ was betrayed, he took bread And he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Poured out for the remission of sins of many. Drink from it, all of you, and give thanks. Let's pray. Father, we set apart now these elements from their common use. Uh, We recognize, however, they remain common. They, they remain bread. They remain the fruit of the vine. But Father, you can use this sacrament in a mysterious way to actually nourish our souls in Christ. So grant us fresh faith. Grant us fresh repentance. Grant us Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.